Great. Well, just well, first of all, uh, who has never touched a record? Never take a, a vinyl record with an auction tape on it like that. Okay, I don't see any hands. So I'm still going to pass them around for you so you can just uh, see uh, what records look like. <laughs> Uh, got a nice blue vinyl. Now these these were uh, these were rejects, so they've been battered and things like that. But uh, I'll pass going to pass those around to you guys. Not yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess we're just going to basically talk about vinyl, and and this is the first time I've ever done this, so please bear with me. This is the beta presentation, hopefully of many. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, how the, the roots are cut into the records and then how the records are pressed. So uh, it all starts with a, uh, a blank lacquer disc called, well, it's just called a lacquer, and uh, it's placed on a lathe and there's a cutting head that's kind of opposite of a needle. And uh, this cutter head uh, will basically edge the grooves into the vinyl. Uh, there's a heating element as well to kind of help that along. Uh, and then there's a whole audio chain from the master to the disc that basically translates all that sound into the grooves on the record so that they can be played back as sound. I won't get into the super technical details of the groove, but uh, there are a lot of uh, a, a lot of things, there's a lot of limitations to vinyl, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, we're used to <coughs> pumping up uh, high end on, on our masters or uh, doing a lot of cool stereo low end frequencies or something. Uh, a lot of that, you, it's kind of, you can't really, or it's very difficult to cut that sound into a groove because of the physical limitations of the record. Uh, so the first limitation I'll tell you about on, on records uh, is that the t uh, limitation of time. You can only put so much time on the side of a record. Uh, so uh, you have two different speeds, mainly 33 and a third and 45 RPM. And you have seven inch records with the small ones that I'm passing around and 12 inch records. And so uh, you can cut a seven inch record at either speed or a 12 inch record at either speed. Uh, basically, you know, for a standard LP that you would buy at the store at 33, you ideally can put 18 minutes on that side. You can put a little more maybe, but you're gonna have to actually change the audio in order to do that. Uh, so that's something that a lot of people struggle with. We get a lot of masters that are very difficult to cut that we have to you know, change the audio a little bit in order to get it on, onto the disc. Um, so uh, the song sequencing is, and, and basically, physically what happens at the end of the side, that's another limitation. So as you get closer to the, uh, the center of the record, the circumference decreases, but the speed's still going at the same, you know, it's still going at the same speed. So what that means is you can get high end distortion uh, if, you're, if your music is too uh, trebly, there's too much sibilance maybe on the vocal or something. That can be a problem. So you know you might realize, look at some of the records in your collection. Sometimes there's like some nice quieter acoustic songs at the end of the side or something, or maybe the side is, isn't as long, so it's not getting to the uh, center of the quite into the center of the record, and that that helps with sound quality. So uh, you could avoid that distortion. Uh, the, I think the big one that we experience a lot is that you can't have. Uh, too much out of phase, low frequencies, or stereo bass. Um, this would cause the cutting head not only to move that groove side to side and cut into the groove, but also up and down. And if it's too much, you're gonna it's gonna skip. The record's gonna skip on any turntable you put it on. So uh, that's something we have a lot of techniques, uh, different. Uh, different things I'll talk about in a moment on how to avoid that and cut the record and still keep some low end. Uh, so those are kind of like just the limitations of the medium. Uh, 
I can talk to you a little bit now about, and show you this video, uh, about that actual process of cutting the record. And so uh, the signal flow, basically, from the master, you'll start with a CD uh, or files on a computer or tape. And at least for our setup at Musical, um, that will go to the mixer. And at the mixer, you can you know, pan it differently. Uh, but it's also set up for uh, a method to adjust those low frequencies, which I'll talk about. So there's, there's a few things you can do there. And the EQ, generally. So if we need to EQ it, take out some high end or whatever, we can do it there. Then it goes to a multi-band limiter. Uh, and this is kind of important for us because if the music has like a big spike, a frequency spike somewhere, it can grab it and you know not let it overdrive the cutting head on the on the lathe, which if it could break it, and that's a very expensive piece to get re remade and, and, and you know there's very few parts left. For this technology, this is all old technology. Um, and then after that it goes to the cutting amplifier, which drives that cutting head and uh, cuts the groove into the record. So uh, the cutting amplifier that we have is a, a vintage tube amp made by Westerns. And it also has some, uh, some high frequency attenuation if, if needed. If the multiband limiter or your EQ didn't do it, this limiter can get in there and get like sibilant vocals or something like that before it gets cut to the vinyl. Now we can cut those frequencies into the record, uh, those high frequencies, but I, I don't think <laughs> to experience, I don't think every record, would, uh, every stylist would even play it back. Uh, it, it would just become distortion. So, um, that's essentially the, the system, and I'll show it to you here. Uh, now, Music Hall was uh, built in 66 uh, in an old uh, house that was the model home for the neighborhood of North Linden uh, in Columbus. And so it was zoned commercial, so John Hall, the owner, was able to just buy it and build a studio onto it. And that was fine, the city didn't mind, it was already zoned for commercial. And uh, very soon afterwards, they put the vinyl pressing plant in the basement. Uh, John is 86, and he still comes in every day, he cuts all the records uh, that we press. And he's an amazing guy to learn from. Uh, I'm really lucky to be able to, to be there and hear about what things, what, what it was like even before analog tape, and where they were just recording to disc. He, he was doing this when there was no analog tape, so it's pretty cool. Uh, so I'll show you this video of John cutting. There's not much sound here, but it will. Oh, there's no sound, okay. No, it's just, I can okay. sound it. So there's John at the lake. Now I'll try to point out different stuff here. That's the blank disc on the turntable. And uh, some, some of these will, uh, some legs will actually have like vacuum suction to, to hold that down. He just puts a little piece of tape on the edge. And it works fine. Uh, so there's the cutting he's head. He's been doing it for a long time. Uh, the cutting head there, and he's able to move that along. And once, it, once he starts the process, uh, he has it all timed, so it will just glide over as, he's, as the groove is cutting. It's moved, and it's one groove on the side of the record. You know, you know, you think about the grooves, but it's actually one, which is smart. So, so the big problem that we have is, is uh, if you see this here, is pitch. That's for the lines per inch. Uh, how many lines in an inch can you cut? Because the groove will <coughs> cut side to side. So you don't want to cut into the adjacent part of the groove, or else you're, you know, it's useless. Play it was scary. So here he's uh, he's just cutting and he's playing back. So this is a test cut. This is a seven inch record on a ten inch lacquer, and so he's able to use an edge as a test. It won't can you be... pause for a second? I have a couple questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if you have to be a little question, you can raise your hand. Yeah, at any point. So, so the lacquer. Where do you get the blank lacquers? Is there a company that just makes? Yeah. I think in the U.S. there's only one company left okay. making lacquers called Transco. There's a place in Japan too. Because those are the masters, so they yeah. and they you buy seven inch, ten inch, and twelve inch 
lacquers. What is, do you know one, just one blank that we're gonna use as the master cost? I, I don't know. Okay. Sorry. Oh, that's okay, that's okay. Yeah. So, good, do you have a question, yeah. Charlie? This is just a production question. So, how do you make like more than one disc at a time or do you not? We'll get to that problem. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get up to that. Yeah. Is there another hand with another question? Okay, I'll ask a couple questions because I, <laughs> So the blank lacquer goes on there, mm -hmm. and the audio then is the, the cut, what's yeah. using, what is being, what's doing <coughs> the cutting? Is it a diamond or? Yes, uh, and it, it's basically a stylus like you would use for playback. But, but it's meant to carve meant out. Meant to carve out the groove. And you said it's heating also, so it's kind of melting a little, just a yeah, little? Yeah, just okay. a little bit. So, I don't know, maybe I'm jumping in. Will there be a lot of shavings? There's actually a vacuum hose attached to the head and it's grabbing it. So once he turns it on to cut, you hear in the other room the vacuum go on. And, uh, okay. and it's it's taking all that uh, material that's being carved out. So you just and then you adjust the lines per inch based on you know the yeah. the, the sweet spot is eighteen minutes. Yeah, well he has a chart for uh, mapped out and I wanted to bring it in and I Oh, okay, so if someone but, went 18 and a half minutes, yes. then you have to adjust the pitch. You just adjust the pitch, so it's like, okay, uh, it's 20 minutes. Well, we have to adjust the pitch to, you know, more lines per inch. And that's, that's when we start getting into compromises. So we might have to bring the volume down. We might have to take the bass frequency So it's not down. cutting as wide on the left because and right. You, yeah, there's the groove, and everything on the side of the groove is called the land. And so if you want some land in between, they can touch as long as you know it doesn't cut into it. And so right. the, the needle would, would go right into the next room. Okay. And it would cool, be, you can keep going there. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so he's doing a test cut right now in this video. Seeing if there's anything wrong in here. We do a lot of metal. Uh, So he's A, B, and right now, he can't really tell. He's going to play back. He has a start of a turntable on there so he can hear back what he's cutting. He's hearing what's going into it, and he's hearing the master. He can flip back and forth so he can compare to get the best reproduction of the master, if that makes sense. And am I losing anybody? Have any questions? Uh, so right now, I think of this, he's just towards the end. You'll be able to see what he's doing. So he gets to the end of the record. You should sit down here. Probably on the springs, a uh, spring reaver about the end. But see, he was just cranking. The, uh, I'll show it again. This is cranking the, uh, uh, the arm on the, on the end. So now that's that's the run out groove to the very end, to the label. And it lifts it up and pulls it out, and there's the lacquer cut. That's now the master. That's the master. Okay. Yeah. You can play it. Uh, some mastering engineers don't play it. Uh, we'll get to that. Here's a picture I got online of grooves on a record. You can see this is kind of close up. Uh, you know how they could possibly cut into each other. It's not uniform. I mean, it is in a way, but they move. They go side to side. They're, they're like little worms or something. You know, but running parallel uh, around the record. So. I have a question. So yeah. when you get the masters, do they then say this is side one and the mastering engineer right. has put the space in the song to start all the transitions yeah. and the la and here's the, the yeah. songs? So like on an MLP, uh, here's a master by the way, I brought one. This is uh, a rejected one and uh, I think he did some test cuts on the other side as well. Uh, so this is for a seven inch. Um, so Basically, he's able to keep the grooves wide apart at the top of the record, and then bring it, bring them back into where they should be. If there's a song space in between, he can widen them out again. So you'll see on this one, 
exactly where to put the needle for the second song. And then when he's done, he writes matrix codes in there. And that's all kind of in-house. Uh, so this one says 11398. That is the 111,398th sign that we've got, um, at least with this number system. Because I don't think we've always had it. Uh, and then sometimes, like on this one, we get a request for writing a message in that we want to prove. And so he has to write all that by hand on this laptop. So I'll pass that around. So as it's being played, is he adjusting the spacing like as it's going? Yeah, and he's doing. It. Now there's a lot of a lot of lathe systems. This is a 1944 Scully lathe with Western's cutting system, uh, the cutting head and, and the hand. Uh, a lot of Neumann lathes have a, a computer that looks ahead. It will adjust all that for you. And those were developed in the 80s, you know. And some of them even have like a digital delay line. That's so you're you're analog source perhaps is even being digitized before it hits the you know the, the record some people don't like that uh, you know yeah. especially if it's 1980s, technology. 1980s you know analog to digital converters <coughs> awesome uh, so uh, I'm to think of the time. yeah so yeah there's different systems John does it all by hand he does all that stuff himself so um, He's kind of uh, a master at this. Yeah. If, if the uh, room wasn't so small, I would invite everyone over to see him do it live. It would be a blast. <laughs> but they, we get some good video and stuff. Um, so, <coughs> his signal path, as I said, has a mixer. And one of the things uh, I just I asked uh, earlier if I could get technical. And, and so, uh, the uh, one of the interesting ways to control that low end bass that might be out of phase or something. Uh, there's two ways that I'm aware of that people use. One is an elliptical EQ. So basically you're saying center everything below 100 hertz, 150 hertz, or whatever. That way, so that's all mono, it's not gonna be a problem to count. The other way, which is what John does, is using some different signals. And so the sum obviously is left plus right. The difference is left plus right, but one of them is polarity adjusted, flipped. And then what that gives you is the information that's only on the sides, only in the stereo portion, no mono signal at all. And so if he gets that, he can roll back the, the low end on the uh, difference channels. And then maybe if he wants to increase it on the, on the sum, the mono signal, and it sounds almost it sounds, I think that's a little more elegant way of doing it than an elliptical EQ where you just sum everything below a certain frequency. This way you can just focus on. So what else uses left plus right, left minus right? Did it in one flow? Inside, recording, inside. right? So you, then it, you can use mid-side processing and mastering, so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit, but yeah. yeah. So in the same way that you'd use mid-side for recording stereo information, they're using the uh, same idea to then do it in the mastering phase. Yeah, so he has that all set up on his mixer and he'll do that. Uh, you know, set it up before, do a test cut, looks at the grooves through the magnifying glass, making sure it doesn't, nothing's getting uh, you know, too close or cutting into the groove adjacent to it. And then if he just goes, cuts the side live, he has to cut it all, he can't stop. He has to do the whole thing. So when he's cutting the record, he has to sit there all 18 minutes and do that yeah. variation by hand, like? Yeah, yeah. Now, we get so much coming in that we're kind of set up as, uh, you know, get it, to, get it to vinyl. Our customers are like happy with the results, but it's kind of like, there's a lot of safety precautions. Uh, a lot of stuff we get isn't mastered for vinyl by an engineer before we and so, you know, we might have, you know, five masters to do that day, uh, which you know takes about five, six hours maybe. And so we can't spend all that time. Also, we'll be charging more to do to cut these, and that's not, you know. So we ask people to get a master for vinyl before it gets to us. But if it's not, we have these systems in place. So I've 
done a record where I had Master for Vinyl and I've sat there with John and I said, okay, there's some low men coming up here and he'll like adjust the groove so that it will compensate as, as we're going. It's, uh, I was intimately familiar with the music. I could just tell him what to do as we went. So uh, that's pretty cool, but that doesn't happen a lot. Um, and so, you know, Master for Vinyl is basically all these things I've been talking about. The, the preparing the signal, knowing that there are limitations for vinyl. <coughs> High frequency response, out of phase space if there is any, fix that. Um, and generally, you know, give us some good headroom. Don't crush the signal with compression because it's going to go through some limit, with limiting anyway. So, um, uh, so at that point, there's a process called plating, and we need to make stampers to actually press these records. And so that lacquer is sent off to, in our case, uh, one of the few plating plants left in the country, which is in New Jersey. And there's a lot of chemicals involved. And so uh, I don't think, I think uh, there's a plant in Cleveland called God Groove Records. And I think they are resurrecting an old plating plant in Cincinnati. Uh, I haven't heard the latest on that. So there might be another place, which is cool, it's in Ohio. Um, basically, they coat that lacquer uh, with silver, and they, and there's a process where you're making a, uh, what they call a mother, uh, and then from the mother, you can create these stampers. Uh, the mother is on file there at the plating plant, so if something happens to these, we can order another stamper. Uh, so basically, uh, lots of nickel, uh, it's solid nickel. And you'll see it's just the opposite of a record. All the handwriting in there is reversed. Uh, I'll pass these around. What's the turnaround time from when you send the... Well, so you do step one, step two... Step two is played off. We send it off. And then those come back to music Those come back in a couple weeks, maybe. Watch the edges on those two. I don't need to get cut. <laughs> they're kind of, they can be sharp, but they're, they're perfectly safe. Uh, Sure. <laughs> so if you have any questions as you see it, just raise your hand. Oh, yes. Um, I have a question about yeah. um, the step space. Sorry, the what? About the step space. So the black screen, what exactly is it? Like a solid? I believe there's like a, it's a plate of metal uh, that is covered with, you know, similar to like a, uh, you know, nitrous soda, lacquer, or polyurethane lacquer. I'm not exactly sure of the specific substance, but it's you know a softer, it, it, it's something that's sprayed on and hardens like you would if you were finishing furniture or an instrument or something like and that. And so, like, if I notice, like, the blue lectures, you know, in terms of different colors, the lacquer is the most. That's the vinyl. Oh, that's the vinyl. Yeah. So the lacquer, lacquer is the master. Yeah, the lacquer is the master, and that's <laughs> used to make these plates to make the vinyl, which I'm going to show you next. It's quite a process. Yeah. Is, is there a way you can set this all up so instead of going to the tape to delay, it could just live sound from the studio on the Yes. Yeah, we have done it. So we have a studio at Musical. I'm house engineer at the studio. And we have done that in probably back in the 80s. We did some jazz recordings and stuff like that. So the band would be playing live up in the studio and we would have the signal sent down to the mastering room. And he would like, give him the signal, he would start the record, and they would play, and he would cut it live as it happened. And yeah, and if they screwed up, then you'd have to toss that, that lacquer and do it again. So. We've actually been talking about, somebody wants to do that, and we've been talking for a few months now about I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> Any other questions at this point in the, in the process? Yes? You mentioned the little silver at one point, so you need to not the lacquer, but the um, yeah. lacquer? Yeah, now I'm not really well versed in that process of making that stamper, but I know, and actually I, I wanted to bring some handouts. I didn't know how many to make, so I just thought I would send you some I can, yeah, we can info that you could maybe email on. But, there's a really good video on YouTube 
uh, that was made in 1956 for RCA records. It's the exact same process. <coughs> it's like <coughs> ten chemical baths. Like yeah, there's like no difference. So I'll send. I'll make sure you guys get the link to that YouTube video. It's, uh, yeah, it's way more science than I ever thought. When I, I've seen that video, so yeah. take that lacquer and you dip it in something to set it up for something. Then you dip it in another bath, and then it attracts the particles and attracts. I mean, it is crazy intensive, which is why they don't do it in half. I mean, it's it's yeah. not like cutting this and doing the EQ. It's absolutely chemical science. Yeah, yeah, and you, you know, everyone's wearing protective clothing and things like that. I'm sure some of these places, uh, like the place in New Jersey, probably you know, is grandfathered in on a lot of uh, safety precautions. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. So I got a quick question. For you. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the the sound of vinyl. question was, uh, people talk about the sound of vinyl and how they like it better or whatever, and your question is, is it the physical thing? It's some part of the I, I, you know, it's, it's I, I have like this little audiophile street where, you know, I get all geeky and listen to multiple different masterings of a, of a recording or something. I always want to start, you know, especially with digital recordings, and you compare them, you say all things being equal. Well, like, how can you say that when you're comparing vinyl to digital? Um, so just to give you an example, uh, Rush, the band Rush has all these reissues coming out of vinyl, and they're also the same, they're, they're mastered at Abbey Road by Sean McGee, he's a great mastering engineer. Uh, they're doing uh, a different process called direct metal mastering, which is actually, instead of a lacquer, they master it to a copper disc uh, instead, and then that's used. And I'm not too familiar with that process in the specifics, but, um, those lack that this holds up a little better than a lacquer, right? Um, so anyway, they press those records, but they also release high resolution digital lossless files as well. And I've compared them, and I have a nice Oppo, you know, uh, CD player that can play files at the turntable. And I know for a fact, he said that these are exactly the same master. And I, I like the record better. It sounds better on my system with my equipment. So that's a question that's debated a lot. Sure. And I think it does have a lot to do with the physical properties of your stylus, of your turntable, of your phone preamp, you know. Um, but also I think that to some extent, these limitations of vinyl are actually very pleasing musically. The high end isn't piercing, the low end is controlled. If you can make a really good record in that with those limitations, it sounds really nice. I mean, obviously electronic music, you know, with really super lows and stuff. I've seen some crazy records that have cut, they've cut with low end and the grooves are way far apart and stuff. So it can you can do that. It's just I guess to, just to answer your question, yeah, I think it does have to do with the physical limitations, and but also the playback is totally different than just a once and series. Right. Yes. Um, do you think that um, record or uh, weight is like um, like a legitimate concern? Like under eighty gram vinyl. Yeah, one eighty gram, two hundred yeah. gram. Uh, no, I personally don't. Uh, I mean, and this guy is a, he's a nerd. Stuff that they geek out about is like super, super like tubes, which tubes sound better. Than stuff, so, so um, I mean, it's a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the, the standard weight of vinyl, I, of a vinyl record, and by the way, yes, um, vinyl, the plural of vinyl is vinyl. There's no vinyls, it's like concrete. You don't say concretes. Okay, uh, so um, the weight of that vinyl uh, and how thick it is, uh, the standard weight is about 140, some of it's even thinner, 120 gram. 180 gram is kind of like a, it started with the audiophile world, they figure, you know, a thicker record, um, you know, denser maybe, less vibration from playback. I, I don't, I mean, we, I, don't, I don't see a huge difference there. There's even 200. 
the, the problem is when you know the physics of playing a record back in the middle is at a your turntable arm is at a certain angle. Um, you know, if if it's higher or if, or if the, the needle is is actually angled lower, let's say have different EQ response. So when, when your record is thicker, it's it's actually kind of changing the, the EQ response of your, if your turntable is set up properly. But that's, we're getting into minutia. Oh. Uh, anyway, so I don't think yeah. 180 is that big of a deal. I think it's just a marketing thing. So we got this, we got the uh, metal, that comes back to music hall. Yeah, so we get that metal back and we have presses in our basement, and this is uh, the grandson of John Hall, John Hall, uh, <laughs> at the press, pressing uh, the seven inch. He's putting, uh, this is him putting the seven inch stamper on the press. And uh, let me freeze it real quick when I get a picture. So he has cardboard down here. What happened was, uh, when I took this video, uh, just a little particle, of dirt got behind the stamper, between the stamper and the die. And so it was causing a little bubble on the record when it was pressed. So we had to remove it, sand the back, clean it with you know, lacquer thinner, and put it back on and make sure that there was no dirt back there. So there is a stamper down here as well, but it's covered up with cardboard because if he drops this and it falls down here, it scratches both stampers and then they're useless. So, um, uh, so basically, that's the A side, the B side's down here. And he's going to take um, a patty, now, and I'll show you also how we get this vinyl. This starts as little pellets, uh, which I brought examples of. They come in various colors. Now, that's vinyl pellets, black, <coughs> opaque red and transparent green. And so here are a couple patties as well. They get he uh, heated up uh, in an extruder and then a certain amount of spit out. And this is what a record starts. They're really hard now, but when they come out, they're super soft and hot and you wear a glove because it is pretty hot. Uh, over here, <coughs> Basically, these knobs on the side. Now, this is, again, this, no one makes this anymore. This is all, like, I think we got these maybe in the 70s. And I don't know how old they were when we got them. But we have a boiler. We have, it pools uh, tons of water uh, in the plant. plant. So uh, we're sending steam and water to heat and cool the, the record while it's in there. So it has to be heated up and pressed down, and the vinyl spreads out inside. And then you immediately have to start adding cold water and cool the whole process down. So he has a temperature gauge up there, and these gauges control how much steam and how much uh, water he's putting in there. And some days it might be really humid out, and the records are coming out warped, so he has to change that. Uh, I, I do this sometimes too. I work once a week in the pressing plant, and it's really frustrating because. You get a record out, it comes out, you have to set it aside to trim the edges because it's bigger than it's supposed to be. But before you can even do that, you have to grab your next one, take the labels, and put them. So he's, the first thing he'll do is put a label, the A side label up there, the B side label down there, put the patty, in, and then send it. And you have to send it in at the right temperature. So if you wait too long, it's too hot, and you're probably going to get a warped record when it comes out, or you know, just something. So that's him just setting that up, and it has to be you know, bolted in so it's, it's tight right up against the die and that it doesn't uh, move around. Uh, because if it moves around in there, then it's not going to work. It won't come out uniform. It won't be, be able to be played. So the kind of edges on a 7 that's a 7 inch or a 12 inch? That's 7 inch. So the edges are made to like kind of fit in that little gap, yeah. right? It's okay. made for you know, a specific size die. So here's the, uh, well that's the hopper, which is at the top of the extruder now. You're going to see in there there's black and blue uh, pellets. pellets. And what we do is we use virgin black vinyl. And a lot of the times we, you know, we have 
records that we reject. And so we grind those back up. And we, especially with the, just the translucent vinyl, we add that in. So we, we're using a mix of uh, virgin vinyl and recycled vinyl. But it actually helps with the flow of the vinyl in the press and, and, and getting a, a nice consistency rather than just using all 180, at least for our set, or 180, what I'm saying. At least, uh, so those marketing buzzwords, virgin vinyl. Um, it's getting confused in my head. So we mix the virgin and the, the recycled vinyl just so uh, A, it saves us money, and B, uh, it actually flows better in our press. So down here, where I'm circling with the mouse, is where you'll see it from the front. That's where the black vinyl comes out in this example. Uh, I'm not a I'm, I'm, I do audio, I don't do video, I apologize. So there we see it. That's, that's the black patty that you're um, passing around, but it is super soft. And there's a little tail there as well that I think he got just needed some extra, so he, he pressed the bucket, had a little extra come out. And now he's going to put that in here. So he took the old the record that he just got out. You can see that it's bigger than a 7 inch. There's, uh, Edging there is called flash, and so that will uh, he'll cut that off. But first, he has to take care of this one. So he's putting the A side label on first on the top, or no, B side on the bottom. Sorry, and he's the A side label on the top, and it goes in. And now he can cut the edge of the uh, the vinyl. And this one's a reject too. It was it was a little warped, I think. So he just tossed it into a pile. And. I don't know if that's all the video I have for that, but... Can you repeat, then, for a thousand records? Yeah, so we do these... We don't have uh, automatic presses. Uh, a lot of places do, they can, you know, they're just going right through. But the, the cool thing about our setup is that if we have a problem, we can spot it immediately. Like, as you know, he saw that it was, it was warped, well, Tossed it, but, but there's another problem is that if the stamper doesn't press the record, if the groove isn't pressed all the way into the vinyl, it comes out looks like this little, uh, on black vinyl especially, there's this little um, whiteness to that, and that's called non fill. And if you ever listen to a record, you just a brand new record, you hear like in the background, there's this little you know, noise that's non fill, that it just wasn't stamped in can actually see it. So every record we have is inspected, and if it doesn't, you know, get scratched somehow while we're handling it, or if it's non fill, or if it's warped, or if the edging doesn't work out very well, then it's just tossed and recycled. What is the rejection rate? Sounds like a lot can go wrong. <coughs> a lot can go wrong. I mean, the first few times I was on the press, I was rejected tons of the records, <laughs> but it was a learning curve. I mean, what, once you get it going, JR, who's, our, uh, who's been doing it for 30 years in our plant, he has a very low rejection rate. So I have a high rejection rate, but I'm only there once a week, and maybe I'll press, and maybe I'll shrink wrap stuff. Uh, okay, so. Uh, we got time for maybe one last question. Yeah, maybe, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Any other questions about this process? Do you find yourself doing mostly, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. We have tons of different uh, for a record so press. Yeah. Like a lot of what? A lot of like modern, like data and something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most of what we do is is independent. We don't have any major labels or any. What's, yeah, what's right. awesome is John Hall is so agnostic. He doesn't mean he's 86 years old and I've been over there when he's mastering. It's some just noise metal band from Japan. He's like, you know, like, so like he, he doesn't care what music it is. It's really interesting, but you know he doesn't get it. I like this record because he's thinking all technical side. I need the low end to be this. I need the high end to be this. I got to cut the grooves. <clears throat> he doesn't care what genre. But he's then got to listen to that whole record. Right. So think about how many records that guy is listening to. <laughs> oh, he doesn't care less about. It. You get a ton of metal, a ton of noise records, yeah. you know, all sorts of stuff.
Awesome. So should we try to get Keith back for the uh, Music Tech Workshop? Yeah. 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 Thanks, guys. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>